Hi, everybody. Welcome to our second day of the Virtual Dickens Universe. My name is Renee Fox, and I am the co-director of the Dickens Project. So on behalf of our director, John Jordan, and our founding director, Murray Baumgarten, I'm so happy to have everybody here and to be able to, to have this virtual week together. Um, before we get started, and before I turn things over to Ryan Fong and our brilliant panelists for today, um, I just wanted to kind of let you know a few things. So the first thing is that today and for the rest of the week, um, we have closed captioning available. So if you um, would like to be able to, to, um, to see subtitles, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, um, on towards the right hand side, you'll see a closed caption button. If you just click on the arrow next to it, you'll see an option to show subtitles. Um, so if you would like subtitles, um, just uh, click on show subtitles and those will be um, available to you and, and you'll be able to see them for the duration of the, um, of the panel today. Um, now, since some of you may be joining uh, the virtual Dickens universe, the Dick Dickens universe world for the first time, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Dickens project and the Dickens, fac uh, sorry, the Dickens universe. So the Dickens Project is an international research consortium that's based here in Santa Cruz and um, that is dedicated to the exploration of 19th century literature and culture. And every year or most years when we are not having a global pandemic, um, during the summer we have a week-long conference called the Dickens Universe, which brings together faculty members from universities and high schools and graduate students and undergraduates and lovers of literature from all walks of life. And we all come to Santa Cruz for a week and we, we, we read one book together, sometimes two books. Usually one of them is a Dickens novel and everyone participates in academic talks and in, um, in seminars and in round tables and in Victorian teas and dances and parties and eats just huge quantities of cake. And it's a really wonderful, um, it's a really wonderful week. And we use these novels um, to open up uh, the world of the 19th century and to think about it in all different aspects and also to, um, to think about the way 19th century novels let us think in different ways about our contemporary world and the things that are going on in it. So sadly, we can't be doing that this year together all on campus, living in dorms, sleeping on uncomfortable dorm mattresses, but we can be together here in this virtual space. And I'm so pleased that, um, that all of you could, could join us today for this. Um, just a few, a few little housekeeping things. Um, I wanted to let you know that this conversation is being recorded and we'll be posting it um, uh, later in the week or, or after the week is over, I'm not sure exactly. So anyone who can't be here for the live, live stream can come back and can, um, can listen to it um, and can see what was said today. Um, during the session, we're gonna be using the Q&A window as the, um, as the platform to communicate with our presenters and each other. So you'll also see the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to, um, enter any questions that you have or to, you know, if somebody asks a question that you feel you know an answer to, to, to respond. Um, we're gonna be moderating those questions and at the, end of, um, at the end of the conversation, we're going to um, pose some of them to our panelists and, um, and let, them, um, let them deal with it. Um, if, you, um, if you see a question you like or you see a question that's kind of like a question you were going to ask, feel free to upvote it and it will rise to the top of the Q&A so we can see which questions um, people are particularly interested in. And you can also use this window as a space of interaction. So you know, if you wanna post a comment or if you, um, you know, if you have a reference that you think would be useful based on what people are talking about, feel free to post it in the window so that people can, um, can see it. Um, I also want to call your attention to a short statement of community guidelines and language. Um, Tara Thomas is posting um, a link to that, which is on our website in the chat um, momentarily, so you can see it. Um, it talks about uh, you know appropriate terminology and just ways that that um, uh, that are appropriate to to talk to each other. So you can re review that on the Virtual Universe website, um, and we'll be using that throughout the uh, throughout the rest of the week. Um, so 
just again, before I turn to the panelists, I want to offer a huge thank you to the people who organized the speakers for this week, Ryan Fong, uh, Jason Rudy, Trisha Lutens, and Bridget Fielder. Um, also a huge thanks to uh, Courtney Mahaney, who is the assistant director of the Dickens Project and has been behind the scenes for all of this, making all of the technology happen and, and keeping things as streamlined as possible. And she's just, she's put in a huge amount of work and, um, and we owe her a, a lot of gratitude. And also, as always, to the Friends of the Dickens Universe, um, which has given our organization so much love and support through the last 40 years well, I don't think they've been around for 40 years, but our organization has been around for 40 years. And as long as they have been, been a part of it and our supporting body, um, they, have, um, they have done everything they can to keep our programming going. So a huge thank you to them. Um, so I'm gonna turn things over to Ryan Fong now and let the panelists begin. Great, thank you so much, Renee. Um, and I just echo the thanks to uh, everyone at the Dickens Project and to the uh, friends of the Dickens uh, Project and for all of their support and help in making this week possible. Um, and thank you to all of you for attending this session. And I, I'm really excited about uh, having this conversation with uh, my fellow panelists here. And um, and when we and the, when I was uh, and the other organizers were planning this week, um, it was really important for us to include a place in the week's program to talk about teaching. Um, certainly all of us who are at teachers at, at any level, all the way from pre-kindergarten to, to colleges and universities, we're thinking about what classrooms are going to look like this fall um, in light of the ongoing pandemic. Um, and we wanted to also kind of use the occasion of this pair to talk about teaching in a way that um, connects it with larger conversations that are taking place in the field around race. Um, these conversations have been made all the more salient in the context of the ongoing uh, global protests against anti-Black violence and the larger Black Lives Matter movement that it's a part. Um, and also, as the title of this, this session um, indicates and makes a nod to, um, to, the, uh, to the various events of toppling of different monuments to enslavers and colonizers, um, many of whom are, were alive and, and enacting their violence in the 19th century, um, and thinking about staging a conversation that will hopefully be a space to really process um, how this context can shape what we do in the classroom, especially as we think critically about what kind of relationship to the 19th century past we want to cultivate um, uh, with our students and, and amongst each other. So as a result, this conversation is gonna be a little bit less tailored to the pair of Harper and Dickens per se, but really about thinking um, about its broader implications. Um, and here, I, I also want to, to um, point your attention to the Dickens uh, Project website and the Virtual Dickens Universe page to the uh, anti-racist and anti-racist pedagogy, um, anti-racism and anti-racist pedagogy reading list that, that Bridget Fielder and I um, curated and annotated, um, specifically with our, our Victorianist colleagues in mind. Um, it's just a beginning of, of a set of resources, but I encourage you to, to take a look at it um, as a, a, a supplement and a side doc document and conversation to the one that we're having today. Um, in this session, as we were planning it, we also really wanted to center the voices and perspectives of Victorianists of color, um, especially those scholars who are still relatively early in their professional careers. Um, all of us are former students of color who were drawn in our scholarly lives in various ways to Victorian studies. And so we can all speak from a place of both experience and expertise and experience as expertise, um, even as we teach at very different kinds of institutions and occupy different places within them. Um, I'm hoping that this conversation can also be a moment when Victorianists of color especially can come into conversation with one another and with our white allies in the field um, and can be a moment where we mark our explicit solidarity as a field with work going on in other fields um, around race, equity, and social justice. So to help facilitate that, um, I want to suggest that everyone tweeting this session, not only use the hashtag uh, HarperDickens2020, which has become the hashtag for this, conf this virtual conference, um, but to inaugurate uh, VicPOC as a hashtag that can hopefully begin connecting a, and creating a VicPOC community with other uh, online communities such as Shakes Race, 
BIPOC 18, figure six, POC 19, um, and many others. So we're belatedly coming to our hashtag, but, uh, but hopefully this can, can um, start creating a community and a sense of connections with, with these other conversations that are happening in other fields. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, my, my um, the, the panelists here um, to, so that they can introduce themselves. Um, and so if you could just say your name and where, where you teach, and also tell us a little bit about your students and how Victorian literature fits into your courses. I don't know who wants to get us started. Well, I can start if we're going alphabetically. Um, by last name, thanks so much, Ryan, and to everyone here for organizing uh, this week and this conversation. And I'm very much looking forward to being in conversation with um, the panelists here, as well as you know, continuing to learn about uh, about these topics. Um, so I'm Ranjani Chatterjee. I teach at Concordia University in Montreal, and just to sort of give you a sense of the institution, it's a pretty big public. Um, University in the middle of the city. Uh, we are fully online in the fall. Um, and I tend to teach, uh, you know, a pretty even mixture of courses that fulfill um, the Victorian studies kind of unit uh, for the English major, as well as courses in sort of more contemporary literature, as well as gender, um, race, and sexuality. And uh, most of my classes tend to be quite large, around sort of 55 or 90 students, unless I have a grad seminar or um, an, an upper division sort of seminar. So that's sort of, um, and also as well, most of my students are, are sort of of varying age ranges, um, which is somewhat standard for um, a Canadian university. Um, so, um, you know, that's kind of like a, you know, a quick rundown of the student body the institution. I think I'm next in alphabetical order, although I'm bad at that. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you, Ryan, for that great start of things. Thank you to all the organizers. The events so far um, from this virtual Dickens universe are wonderful, and I can't wait for the upcoming events this week. Um, I'm Alicia Kristoff. I teach at Amherst College, which is a small liberal arts college in Western Massachusetts. Um, about 1,700 students total. Um, I teach in the English department. Um, Amherst has an open curriculum um, and the English department has very few distribution requirements as well. Um, so that is, you know, that's part of the story. Um, I tend to teach, I, I tend to teach straight up kind of Victorian literature courses less and less as my career progresses. Um, I tend to teach Victorian novels in kind of different settings and different constellations. Um, so for instance, I teach a first year seminar called Big Books, which I inherited from others who came before me. But in that class, we read three long novels. So I often start with Middlemarch, then do the first volume of In Search of Lost Time, and then read Octavia Butler's Lilith Brood. So something like that, right? or another course called Reading the Novel, which selects kind of five novels and I'll often have one Victorian novel in the mix. So I can say more about that as we go deeper into the conversation, but that's kind of how I am teaching Victorian novels in particular these days. Um, I guess maybe just one more word about Amherst College. Um, it is quite a diverse institution um, in terms of kind of like racial diversity and socioeconomic diversity, um, first generation college students. Um, I think roughly 50% of the students identify as being people of color. Um, and so that's a really wonderful thing. We have really supportive financial aid, which is another wonderful thing. But there, you know, it's also a really historically white male college, right? And so there are a lot of ways in which the culture of the place hasn't shifted in keeping up with these demographic shifts. And so that's something we're kind of like working out all the time. And that, in fact, um, our students, have been leaders and kind of helping to catch the institution up to where it needs to be. So yeah, that's it for now. Uh, I think I'm next. Uh, I also wanna thank all the organizers and all the people in the audience, uh, in the virtual audience today for joining us. Uh, my name is Sophia Su. I am an assistant professor of English at Lehman College CUNY, it's a CUNY in the Bronx. Um, and my 
college is a Hispanic serving institution, which means it's at least 25% Latinx students. Uh, we have significantly more. We have a, a little over 50% of our students are Latinx. Um, about a third of our students are Black. Um, a little over 50% again are first generation students. Um, we also have a wide range of ages in our classes and a lot of students are coming back from taking some time off or, you know, they're just starting college at a later time. Um, my department is in the middle of curricular revision, so um, it's unclear what my role will be uh, in terms of teaching Victorian Lit in the future, but as the curriculum exists now, um, we have a pretty traditional, I would say, uh, English curriculum and it's very heavily British uh, and so my role in that at least in the core curriculum is to teach the uh, kind of late British survey so from romanticism to modernism so that's where Victorian lit I think comes in most predominantly um, and in, in its most traditional form um, similarly to Alicia I also teach these other courses where you know maybe a, a text or two comes from Victorian lit. So I'll teach something similarly like the novel where I have one Victorian novel. Um, I've taught a health humanities course. So I'll teach, you know, a couple texts from the Victorian period. Um, you know, intro to the majors course or, you know, I'll insert a little bit from the 19th century here or there. Stuff like that. Uh, so I think, yeah, we're um, at Lehman, we're, we're rethinking kind of the British foundation of our curriculum. Um, but that's where we are right now. Morning, everybody. So again, thank you to everyone and the 345 people in the audience, which is amazing. Uh, so I am Alicia Walters, and I am an assistant professor at Penn State Abington College. So you've all heard of Penn State. Abington is in the Philadelphia suburbs, so I live in Philly, and our population <laughs> could not be more different than the population um, at main campus. Main campus is predominantly white, um, and it's a residential campus. I teach at a campus where 56% of the students are not white, um, kind of an even mix uh, between Black students, Latinx students, Asian Americans, and then up until this year, international students, which will change obviously dramatically um, for all of us. And like 40% of our students receive Pell Grants, um, and most of our students, regardless of ethnicity, are first-generation college students. So, um, I enter the classroom with a very different set of expectations of what my students know and what uh, they're bringing to the classroom, which is not to say it's a deficit, it's just different and I think often um, really generative. Um, in terms of what I teach, I am lucky enough in that I still do get to teach uh, some upper level Victorian classes, but I also teach um, probably majority composition and lower level gen ed. And I do find a way of bringing in uh, 19th century uh, text in all of those classes. But of course, that looks really different depending on what they're interacting with, as we all know. Um, and yeah, I think that pretty much speaks to our campus. We're about 3,500 students total. Um, so not huge, but not the smallest campus either. And I will just say that because these are not students that are coming in with any sort of expectations as to what Victoria means. We can really kind of make it what it, what it means or what we think it should be. So um, I'm never disappointing someone if I don't teach that really traditional um, version of the Victorian survey class. Thanks. Great, and I'll just briefly say that um, I'm Ryan Fong. As, as many of you who've been, been uh, seeing me over the course of this week already know, I teach, I'm an associate professor at Kalamazoo College. Um, which is in Michigan, um, and we are uh, a small uh, liberal arts school, um, residential, um, maybe up until this year, um, but, uh, hopefully residential again. Um, it's, we have about a little over 1,400 students, a um, uh, little over a third identify as, as, as students of color, um, and um, a lot, uh, although we're increasingly um, drawing from a, a national pool, a lot are coming from the Midwest as well. Um, I teach 
um, some, uh, we all, uh, all I, all we teach is undergraduates. So I teach um, some undergraduate courses. I do have a Victorian literature course, a 19th century women's literature course, um, but the 19th century texts do find their way into a lot of different um, courses that I, I teach as well. So uh, just a little bit of background uh, um, uh, about me. So, um, so let's get, get rolling with, with some of these questions here. Um, so just as kind of a starting point, um, even if you're, you're not teaching kind of a Victorian lit survey per se, um, what is important to you um, in teaching Victorian texts, especially in the context of 2020 in your classes? Um, what draw, drew you to these texts? Why do you keep assigning these texts? Um, and how might you even be moving away from, from uh, teaching some of these texts as, as well? Anyone can go get started. I, I can go. Um, this question of like why we should teach Victorian Lit in 2020. Um, so I, I am Canadian, I, I teach in the States, but um, I grew up in Canada in the 80s and 90s, right? So here, here and in Canada, there's a lot of, of willful cultural amnesia about what, about how, why we are the way we are, about the institutions that have structured our lives, whether we're talking about, um, racial injustice or mass incarceration. And so I feel like when we read these texts, it can act as a bulwark against these kinds of cultural amnesias. Like quite literally, you, you can see um, the modern system of mass incarceration being built at Eastern State Penitentiary. You can see the construction of the idea of race that sort of, um, that very much structures our lives, especially now in 2020, but always, we all, most of us knew always did. And I think, for my students and for all of us teaching, it can become these moments of um, aha. And like, it's very easy to touch uh, something in a 19th century text and see it inhabiting the present moment. And I think it's necessary because we don't like to talk about these structures. In fact, there's like a, a visceral distaste um, in doing so. I, I could answer the rest of that, but I, I wonder what other people think about why 2020 and, uh, I would absolutely agree. Like one of the, I think, most important things about teaching Victorian literature now um, is to emphasize those historical continuities and right, to show how Victorian literature codifies and critiques those modern institutions. Um, I would add to that, uh, that for me, um, I'm particularly interested in showing my students who are predominantly black and brown that Victorian literature is with theirs too. Um, and I think that goes to kind of Ryan's question about what drew me as a person of color to this literature. Um, because I think uh, what scholars of color tend to, at least what's assumed is that we're going to study our own literature, whatever that is. Um, and Victorian literature doesn't seem obviously to be my literature. Um, and that's something that I make explicit in the classroom. Um, is to think through like, well, why are we students of color, faculty of color, et cetera, uh, studying this stuff? Um, and what can, it, what can it give to us and what can we give to it? Um, and so that's, I think, one of the big reasons too that I think is really important about studying Victorian lit or teaching Victorian lit now um, is to, yeah, to, to make it ours, to make it our students. Yeah, I think along with Sophia's um, point about the ongoing value of modeling for students, um, you know, what it means to engage with texts, with a field, with a historical period that is usually or has been canonically sort of linked very much with whiteness as scholars of color, there's a kind of decentering that um, can already happen, uh, you know, in terms of embodiment. But it's also, a, a, I think, modeling a range of kind of affective relationships to texts. And so showing students that you can critique and engage and think with um, Victorian literature, not necessarily solely on the models of identification through, through love, through fandom. Um, and that doesn't mean that we're excluding, you know, the kinds of pleasures that Gretchen Garzina mentioned yesterday and sort of like reading these novels, but that they exist in a kind of range of affective relationships that can involve kind of um, discomfort, um, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, quite a high degree of discomfort, ambivalence, um, 
and that we sort of need to entertain that entire range of, of relationships. Yeah, I think I would, you know, mostly just affirm what other people have said, but also, you know, just studying this process of like, how did this come to be that like these were enshrined as like the classic or like as the neutral text, right? Like as if they are not about race and the way that others are, or other texts are viewed as more particular, like how did that happen? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what are the reading strategies that kind of cut against that grain? Um, and so, yeah, following off with what you were saying too, Ranjani, effective, um, you know, richness and also just like, you know, recognizing the complexity of texts and the different ways that you can engage them in the different uses that they can be put to, right? Like recognizing that like you can take pleasure and think this is a beautiful novel and I'm stunned and blown away. And also like I have a critique to make, right? Like I see a construction of whiteness that excludes me in this text, just that you can do both of those things at once, right? Like these are capacious objects. Um, and I think for me, they invite engagement with more contemporary texts and theoretical texts in particular, because that's how I can start to see how they were constructed that way. Right, and like the reading operations that construct them in particular ways. So it's partially just my mind and my bent of thought, but like I need to be putting them into conversation with more contemporary work for me to fully engage what's happening there. I don't know how the rest of you sort of first read Victorian literature, but um, going back to sort of what drew us to it, I mean, I know that my, my mother was like raised in colonial Trinidad and then she would have these novels that like you were just saying at least here are classic novels lying around there and I read them and I'm like this is pleasurable but also there's a lot of black people in these texts and why why is no one ever talking about these people and then I would take a class um on like Jane Eyre and like are we going to talk about Jamaica at all like no and, it, and I mean it should it's kind of shocking that like in the aughts like no one was really still weren't talking about it that explicitly it was like a unit that we checked off but I, was, uh, I always felt reading it like it was obvious to me just as a raw reader how important these colonial sites were to like literally financing and like building these home worlds and there were people that were supposed to be like me haunting these novels or in the novels themselves and uh, so I might not be the expected reader but I there I was and we can talk about the problems of like what the U looks like in these texts, but I found the erasure of just even discussing that there are people that look like us in these texts, like baffling. And so I think when I started teaching these novels, that became like the number one thing that I was going to do for myself and my students. So I don't know how you guys feel. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. Um, I just remember there's one point in my teaching um, where I was, I was, we were in the middle of, white teeth actually um and my students were having a hard time and it was a, it was a class of a lot of you know first generation second generation immigrants um and they were having a hard time talking about it i wasn't really sure why because i just assumed that this group of students would be able to engage and identify with the characters of white teeth um and one of my students raised her hand and she was like i, I wish we could read jane eyre you know, I, I identify with Jane Eyre, and I just remember it like taking a moment and being like, okay, well, I mean, I assume that they would relate to this because of their backgrounds, a faulty assumption perhaps, um, but there is something also really productive about discussing like, why do you, uh, you know, identify with Jane Eyre? What might it mean um, for you to not then identify with? say Bertha in that text or you know these other texts these contemporary texts might that might supposedly speak to your experience directly um, and I think it's again talking about those moments of discomfort that Ranjani mentioned right I think that's a really kind of productive moment to just pause and think through a little bit what is it about Victorian literature that draws us in um, and, and that we you know we like it in a way right that's why we decided to focus on it um, but there's also something and that's something I'm working through, right? There's something uncomfortable about the fact that I like it so much. Do other folks have uh, want to respond to what Alicia and Sophia are, are, are saying there? Well, I mean, I'll just sort of, um, you know, add on to Alicia's point about teaching growing up in Canada and teaching now in Canada as well, which brings a kind of set of challenges around approaching the Victorian that I almost 
I had sort of forgotten from my childhood and now I'm faced to confront again, which is that Canada has this like particular um, sort of uh, PR campaign around its like happy, diverse multiculturalism. And so like you're sort of um, having to untangle that for students um, in, in ways that, you know, um, yeah, really involve a lot of labor sometimes. And um, it's, it's not like a PR machinery that I'm exempt from. I mean, growing up, it was always just like, oh, you know, Canada's great and we fixed everything. Um, and um, also um, well, we have this sort of like, you know, lovely celebratory relationship to England and the Queen. And so having to just sort of like untangle those layers of like, um, you know, like colonial object relationships, relations to, um, you know, these books, um, you know, is, is a sort of ongoing process for myself as well as for my students, I think. Yeah, and I just appreciate how, how much all of you are, are underscoring, and I, and I, I feel this myself, about the, this kind of idea of the, the complicated attachment, <laughs> I think, that we all, all have. And then the ways in which that complicated attachment um, as a personal experience is uh, can and can be a very productive point of entry for thinking critically about these materials, thinking about the history of reception around them um, and how that looks different in different national contexts. I mean, I wish we had um, a, uh, a, a British colleague here to, to kind of think about what the Victorian means in, in, in the UK and then even some other, other uh, colonial sites around the world. But I mean, I think it's like thinking about the, the Victorian as still a very potent and very, very complex um, uh, signifier. Um, that, that operates and, and seems to be clear what we mean, um, and yet is, is really unclear, especially when we consider the, our, our different personal relationships with them as well. So um, moving on to the, the kind of second question here, and in, in many ways it builds off of, of what we've already been talking about. So gesturing to the title <laughs> of the, the panel, so as statues monumentalizing enslavers, colonists, and racists, many from the 19th century are being torn down, um, is there anything that needs to be toppled in the teaching of Victorian literature? Um, are there certain texts, certain authors? Here we are at the, the virtual Dickens universe. Um, certain approaches, perhaps even the category of Victorian itself. Um, and here, of course, I'm thinking about um, in, in the, the brilliant challenge to the field that um, Alicia and Ranjani made uh, along with their colleague, um, Amy Wong, um, in Undisciplining Victorian Studies. Um, but I'm also thinking about a recent um, thread on Twitter that Nathan Hensley posted uh, uh, with a reader's report about the, the Norton Anthology of English Literature, where he's talking about kind of the, the anthology and the Norton in particular as an institution. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering um, how you all are thinking about um, what needs to be toppled, but also maybe also what, what needs to be built um, in, in Victorian studies and the teaching of Victorian studies um, and Victorian texts. It's such a, yeah, I can start. It's, it's a really big question. And, you know, I think, you know, clearly I have a lot to say, <laughs> um, a lot that I want to think about in terms of, I think, building coalitions with other scholars and building um, across disciplines. Um, like, that's what our piece is largely about. So I have a lot of views about that, and I can talk more about that. But I just, I wanted to start with something more minor, which is that I just can't resist adding, I don't know if people caught this, but the the image that was attached to our LARB piece was of people defending a statue of George Eliot. <laughs> and I still like, don't exactly know what was happening there, like who was joking and who was not, and like what all of the operations around that are. But since you, you know, frame the question that way, Ryan, I guess I want to like, actually just kind of reframe, you know, just a bit and say like, I don't know if it's like this binary opposition, right? Of like, do we keep George Eliot or not, right? Like, I, I mean, I do think we keep George Eliot, right? But it's, I think it's about managing complexity, right? Like, I think it's about us being able to say, like, I love Middlemarch, and I also recognize that there are many ways in which this is built upon violence, right? And like, built on the slave trade, right? Like, built on colonialism. I'm thinking about like, Nancy Henry writing about like the building of George Eliot's wealth through colonial investment, right? So for me, the question is like, how do we hang on to like the multiplicity of, of this historical reality? Like how do we grapple with all of the facets of it, right? And be able to like look at all of those things at once. So that's just a first answer, but that's, a, that's my start. 
Well, I also think students need to be brought into these questions and to also, um, you know, engage critically with this kind of very literal and also very symbolic and figurative problem of toppling statues. I mean, I'll say that when I saw the video um, circulating or the multiple videos circulating on Twitter about the, um, in which BLM protesters sort of take down the, the statue of Edward Colton and throw him into the sea, I was, you know, absolutely struck. Um, and, you know, to me, it's an incredibly teachable moment. Um, you know, I can see any number of Victorian courses beginning with that video and contextual material. Um, and then asking students to sort of like, you know, think about that question, right? Um, because it's sort of like about history, it's about race, it's about um, archives and monuments, it's also about media, about representation. Um, so it sort of reverberates, I think, throughout a number of different questions. Yeah, and I would add that one of the things that we need to consider is like, what, what are we teaching when we teach Victorian lit? Like, are we that invested in the contents? Um, and I will say, like, most of my students will not go on to become Victorianists, right? They won't go on to get their PhDs, and that's fine. That's probably what should happen, because we don't have enough resources for the PhDs now anyway, right? Um, so in teaching Victorian lit, like, it'd be great if they retain some of the content, but that's not what I'm invested in. I think it is, as Ramjani is saying, in these critical, and in, in kind of encouraging a critical imagination, um, right? If, if I'm modeling to them or with them um, how to deconstruct the Victorian itself, then maybe they can apply that to whatever other statues they think need to be toppled and whatever else that they think needs to be rebuilt in the space that's left. I, I really love uh, the thoughts of managing complexity and the sort of um, looking at how we re-examine the canon, what we teach. And um, I was thinking about what I, like, like you, I don't think almost none of my students will become Victorianists. And they, as you say, that's absolutely fine and probably preferable, <laughs> but um, just because of the job market. But I think one of the things that that we need to, to do is sort of, uh, I've said this in a, in a way before, is like these texts when we're talking about race, like um, Alicia mentioned, middle March is built upon violence. And if we sort of center that, um, the fact that this world is constructed and built and only exists because of these things that have been made invisible, um, I want them to see that. So I'm always sort of wanting to see, for example, how Western thought and blackness are like not separate things and that you can't have this construction of Western thought without recentering blackness. And it, both things are happening at the same moment and the suppression or the integration of blackness into Western thought is what has constructed its, its moment right, right now. So this sort of making those connections and for them to understand the real kind of intellectual complexity of these texts, but also then of course recognize what's happening in this current moment is what I think is most important. A student of mine, um, brilliant student, a transfer student last semester, she wrote um, a dazzling paper on Uncle Tom's Cabin and forms of um, black masculinity in that text comparing Tom and George Harris. And out of the blue sends me an email during the racial uprising saying, I feel like I, this is directly related to what I wrote about and looking at the way that um, black men are being discussed in the public discourse takes me exactly back to these structures in the novel. And um, I may have gotten a little misty eyed because I was just like, this is exactly what you should see. And she wants to do something in a more active way. And if, if even like a couple of students can make those connections, and I think this is why we're here, right? Yeah, I so appreciate the way that that you all I think are, are highlighting quite rightly um, that the the question of kind of who we monumentalize and why I mean is is not really the the question I mean it's 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 the the question is about like well what what is the impulse to monumentalization in the first place and 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 are we teaching Victorian literature 
to monumentalize it. And I think um, some, sometimes there is, is that impulse, you know, the, the, the greatness of Dickens, the greatness, uh, the great inimitability of Dickens or, or Eliot or, you know, in, insert any, any other thing. And that, that I think what you all are, are really elucidating very powerfully is that, that that's not necessarily what's gonna win the day with our, our students, um, um, just as a practical matter. And it also is, is, is maybe ethically, and, and I would say is ethically suspect, um, right? If we're, if we're trying to kind of think through what this literature means, how we put it into context with our present moment, um, in, the, in the lives of us and our students, um, and, and what our relationship is. Um, and so uh, perhaps what needs to be torn down the most is, is the desire to monumentalize. Um, and, and even as we can raise questions about like, well, why is there a statue to Eliot, but not a statue to any number of, of, of other authors, including, you know, as we can think about for the, the, the virtual Dickens universe, thinking about Dickens and Harper, right? Why is there a Dickens universe and not, there hasn't been a Harper universe, even though she was deeply, deeply important in, in the 19th century in, in the circles um, that, that she communicated in. Um, so I didn't know if you had, had any other things that you wanted to, folks wanted to add to that. I just wanted to tack on really quickly to what you said, Ryan, you know, the desire to monumentalize. And I think for me, what's really problematic is the desire to compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think really what we need to start doing is having more conversations like, like the one this week. Um, you know, so yeah, I think, I think trying to keep all these as like separate interests or think that, you know, like Alicia said, like there's no kind of like conversation between I forgot how you put it, but like modern Western thought and ideas about blackness and racialization, right? That's so false, right? So to start like breaking down some of those false separations is really important to me. Great, great. So th this kind of, I think, leads, leads to the, the next question, um, which is about um, kind of what frameworks and approaches, and we've already kind of been talking about them a little bit, do you use to set up discussions of race uh, around Victorian materials? Um, and what do you want students to learn or come to understand about the quote unquote Victorian texts, um, especially around issues, issues of race? Um, as you kind of work through these texts in particular, kind of how do you approach them and, and what do you want students to, to kind of take away through that approach or, or set of frameworks? Who wants to start? <laughs> I guess I could start. Um, I don't know if this quite gets at the question directly, um, but one thing I like to do in framing Victorian materials is to make really explicit like the politics of canon formation and like what can um, canonical English lit and just lit, you know, literature in the English language say, what can it say and what can it not say? Um, and so a pairing that I really like to teach together is uh, Thomas Macaulay's Men on Indian Education and uh, an excerpt from Ngugi Watiango's Birth of a Dreamweaver. And actually, Ryan, you helped me come up with this pairing, if you remember. Um, and it just set up like, I, I really like starting with that just because, you know, we can think through again, like, why are we learning about British literature, Victorian literature um, in 2020 in the Bronx, you know, um, and specifically in the context of my department, when we are in the middle of curricular revision and curricular revision that was prompted by student activism, um, I want to make sure that students recognize or understand that like, faculty are taking their concerns seriously. Um, and I want them to use the classroom as a space where they can you know, work through those those debates um, through the course itself. Um, so I think starting with that and yeah, thinking through yeah, what can and cannot be said within English literature is one way um, to at least frame the silences um, within the, the text that we will interrogate later on in the course. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll also, um, you know, Going back to Alicia's observation or you know, argument about how, you know, what we're doing with our students when we're thinking about race is getting them to see and think differently and read differently because so much of thinking about race and racialization involves 
sort of um, confronting, you know, mass forms of erasure. Um, and that just simply involves a different methodology, a different sort of reading practice. Um, it also involves, you know, as again, Alicia mentioned, sort of untangling certain very, very foundational assumptions students have about agency, about subjectivity, about aesthetic form, um, uh, you know, about freedom, about all number of, of sort of very, very essential ideas. Um, and that's, you know, ongoing labor. It's not going to be solved by adding um, you know, one text to a class or, or sort of skirting away those uncomfortable questions as, as um, so Sophia mentioned. Um, and I think we probably all have different strategies for approaching this. Um, I often, as Alicia mentioned, sort of use contemporary theory to help sort of open up and contextualize um, texts in the 19th century. So, you know, I often, when I teach Mary Prince, sort of give students a quote from Sadia Hartman's Venus in Two Acts about the sort of foundational violence that, you know, structures the archive of slavery. And we sort of like talk through, um, you know, what assumptions about agency, about voice, um, about gender, um, freedom, we're sort of bringing to um, reading that text and sort of working to sort of untangle um, those those assumptions. So that's kind of one one thing I do. For me, uh, one of the frameworks that I find is most useful in my scholarship and in the classroom is getting them to do the uncomfortable work of the affective encounter with race, the emotional encounter with race, and what is it doing in this text, right? So, um, and that's such a huge thread of constructing race in the 19th century. You know, I think we all know that if we've read um, feature Stowe or slave narrative, right? So, and I, and just sort of understanding that it's not just that these Victorians are emotional and have these um, unusually heightened responses to difference, but that this is actually a, like our emotional responses to others are a key way in which race is allowed to exist and persist and the way it's structured. And it's not inherently good or bad, but it is a mechanism in which we should be trained to encounter race beyond just, um, you know, hair and skin and nails and teeth, right? So those sort of, that other mode of race. Um, and a way that I can make it seen uh, in a way that's unfamiliar is, so my, while my campus is pretty diverse, the English program itself tends to be more white, okay? So in the classes, one of the first things I'll do if I have the chance is to denaturalize whiteness for them in a way that they've never thought of before. Um, so the most recent example when I was teaching of Victorians in race class was we looked at um, some of the writings from um, Edward Long and Brian Edwards from the 18th century, which is like you know directly influencing how we look at race in the 19th century. But um, I believe it's an Edward Long text. Uh, he talks about whiteness and the, how white bodies literally change the second they you know, are in tropical space, like deepened eye sockets and things that seem bizarre to us and to them. But then you know, when you move beyond the laughter, it's, they start to sort of see the malleability of whiteness and how it's always sort of been this way. And it gives a deeper context to how whiteness is now structure, right? So and once you can do this in the classroom, and and I do this because I want to denaturalize it, but also I find that they are more comfortable talking about whiteness and blackness because they feel like if I say the wrong thing, like it's not as big of a deal, and that allows us to have a discussion. And this works, I think, in a predominantly white classroom um, in particular ways. And then you're allowed to import these structures over when you're talking about how blackness is formed and how it is and is not like whiteness, right? So I think it's a useful way to both decenter what they don't have been trained to unsee, but also to see structures that um, form like, you know, the, these texts that we're all talking about, including Jane Eyre or whatever else. Alicia, can you talk a little bit about the, the kind of um, cross period comparisons that you, you stage in your class and kind of what, what that does? Because that seems like a, a particularly potent approach um, that, that you use um, kind of in your, in your class context particular and in particular and kind of what that does to the category of Victorian and how that kind of uh, 
changes what you what you're doing with with that in the class. Sure. Yeah. Um, I can I can try to talk about that a little bit. Um, I think one example that has been on my mind is the kind of thinking about Middle March with Octavia Butler's Lilith Brood, um, and it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, so I think, so in that class we've read Middlemarch first and then and then Lilith Brood and then a much richer conversation happens about Middlemarch after we've read Lilith Brood, right? Mm. And start asking questions about like, okay, if we read this as a feminist novel, like how were we defining femininity, right? Like, what did we mean by that? You know what I mean? Questions like that. Um, and also questions about like, you know, epic and scale, like how does that change in, you know, Middlemarch, which is aspiring to that, but within like, a single woman's like life, right? In a short span of her lifetime versus Lilith's Brood, which is um, a trilogy, right? Of three novels put together and that spans like multiple, multiple generations and is thinking about like evolutionary development and about kind of technological like intervention in, in development of species, right? It's like all of these different things, right? So all of a sudden, you know, Middlemarch, like I think it becomes richer, but also just the some of the coded ways that we've kind of inadvertently ended up talking about it i think are exposed i don't know if i'm doing a great job of kind of explaining that um and just like you know assumptions about sexuality um are uncovered through that amazing amazing text but something else i have in mind is just um in in kind of one of the twitter responses to the larb piece one of my former students um probably from like eight years ago or something chimed in he, he was really kind and he was just like oh, like, I'm so glad that I got to learn Middlemarch in the context of reading it with Octavia Butler. Like, that's great that I was trained in that more undisciplined way. But it was this interesting moment for me because I distinctly remember him in class arguing about it, right? Being like, but this isn't as good. Like, why are we reading science fiction? Like, can you really do the same things like close reading the sentences as we could do with Middlemarch? And so it was a kind of amazing moment because, you know, we had to, like, we had to work through that together. Like, I had to teach him to ask questions about, like, what do we mean by literary value? Like, what, what kinds of um, techniques of analysis do we use on novels and what do they yield? Um, what kinds of arguments can novels make? What are the different ways in which they make them? What are our critical strategies for approaching, approaching them? Like, what materials do we need to understand the arguments of novels, right? So, you know, yeah, it was just this kind of amazing moment where I saw like, okay, good, like something worked, but it was, it was difficult, right? Like it took yeah. some real hashing out. Um, so yeah, that's kind of just one example I have in mind if that helps answer your question, Ryan. No, that's great. And I think, um, you know, we're, we're slowly coming, running out of time, but I kind of wanted to, to build off that response. I mean, I think one of the last questions that, that we wanted to talk through together was um, just, kind of, and you're, you're getting at this a little bit, Alicia, is, is how you, how do you all structure your time with your students in the classroom in kind of really nitty gritty ways and your, their interactions with you um, and with the text and how is that work tied to your anti-racist commitments? Um, and if there are any particular assignments um, that where you stage this as well, if there's any kind of real specific ways that this happens kind of on the ground um, in your classes that, that have worked well for you. So I, something that's um, kind of really important to my teaching and I try to use um, increasingly is, is actually just like staging having conversations with other scholars in my classroom. Um, and it's something that I do more and more and I think it's something that's really, um, really important. Um, and I think lately um, in particular, I try to show students um, how I have tried to learn and tried to build scholarly community with my peers um, in, in particular people at my stage but also other women of color um so like doing the work with Ranjani and Amy for example but there's all kinds of other writing groups that I'm in and that I really try to think about this um so I try to kind of um model for them um something that's worked for me and been really important which is like really thinking about trusting women of color trusting their work trusting ourselves um rethinking the ways that we kind of envision authority um, whom we're citing, who we think is, you know, the absolute authority on any given subject. Um, so I try to model that by talking to my students about that, showing them how I do that in my work. Um, and then also giving them chances to talk to one another, giving them chances not just to write a paper to me, but to write to each other, to even 
I can talk about this more if we have time, but I, I know we're running out, but even also giving them chances to write papers together. Um, I have a new way that I've done that in the age of, you know, social distancing and Zoom learning, where they're building paragraphs from one another and do like a constellation of many papers that um, really, I think, allows them to think and to work without feeling like it's about performance or genius or reputation. Um, and that allows them to use their minds together. So I know other people have a lot to say, but just a lot about practices in the classroom that model these different kinds of relation making and rethinkings of power and authority. I didn't know I'd if other to, folks uh, wanted to. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just say really quickly, uh, I, I just think it's what you're saying is so important about decentering mastery and like the, re the reasons we like to, to be in charge of the knowledge, but like there's reasons why we shouldn't always be. Uh, assignments that I have used recently, um, allowing students to do a creative project at the end as a way to sort of um, uh, show their engagement with this material, particularly when we're talking about race um, in a particular way, and then um, paired with sort of meta uh, analytical write up of what they did. Um, and a couple of examples recently, um, you know, like students were using imagery um, from text to sort of construct a subject and showing how the <laughs> The, the aesthetic violence in the text would actually look like in real form, right? Like they were um, drawing Tonga actually from the sign of the four and showing the sort of aesthetic violence that we skip over. But when you actually make this into an object, um, it looks inhuman and she was sort of mediating what that meant to her and then wrote up um, a report. So I think um, even not making everything but the final paper um, is a good way of having our students um, engage in ways that are as, if not more, meaningful. I'll jump on that as well. I've done creative final projects too, and actually this past semester um, I was teaching a graduate seminar uh, and I gave them a menu of options for the final project. Uh, one, because you know, the, the graduate students in our MA program were mostly kind of middle and high school students, so, or not middle and high school teachers, so I felt like giving them you know, a typical seminar paper didn't make sense. Um, so I gave them some options and they also proposed their own projects, but like some were creative, um, a lot were pedagogical. Um, one person decided to write a traditional research paper, but I think there's ways to do that on the undergraduate level too, to, to allow more student choice in how they respond to the course. Um, another thing I like to do is team teaching. Uh, so I, I would have to think about how that works in our new virtual reality. Um, but when we were meeting face to face, I had uh, groups of like three or four um, just take over a class. Um, and they all hate it when I assign it, but they all love it once they do it, you know, because they all feel like, oh, I can't teach this stuff. And it turns out really great. And they love the kind of support they get from their peers and um, how much discussion comes out of it. Um, and I, it, you know, I think it speaks to Alicia's point about decentering authority and who, who, who has expertise here. Algenie, did you want to jump in really quickly here? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that I'm already learning a lot from this, this conversation about, you know, what strategies and resources to use to kind of continue to, um, you know, build coalitions with other um, women of color who are teaching, who are doing scholarly work, who are doing activist work, and to make use of those resources that exist. I mean, um, you know, teaching online or remotely, pro I think, provides one opportunity to defer expertise to others. You don't have to stand in front of your classroom and lecture. Indeed, you should not, right? You cannot, um, many of, of us with, res you know, other kinds of caring responsibilities. And so, um, you know, using the resources that are available, um, uh, I don't know, Lisa, if you want to just briefly mention the uh, POC 19 mutual aid sort of um, uh, program that's been been set up, but I'm, I'm looking forward to just kind of um, trying to defer to others who have um, more of the expertise and knowledge around um, uh, some of this work than, than I do in the classroom. Mm -hmm. 
Do you want Do you want to say anything about that, Alicia, really quickly uh, before uh, we get to questions? It's a brand new resource, so I don't know if folks have seen it. I've I've um, heard you know talk about it on the there's a POC nineteen listserv, and now there's it's also um, kind of being advertised on Twitter. But it seems like a wonderful resource, a kind of like mutual aid resource for teaching this fall and and likely beyond. Um, just saying, this is a difficult time, right? Which is like so important to acknowledge. Like we're living in crisis. Like people need to be gentle with themselves and maybe really rethink what to expect of themselves and their students like as we go through this um, and so just a resource for making teaching more doable for everyone and just um, like a it's kind of just like a set of spreadsheets around like hey I have a syllabus about this would you like to use it hey like I could I could offer this YouTube lecture that you can use in my class and then you do one for me right like just a sharing of resources that seems really important and Maybe with that new hashtag, Ryan, VicPoc, maybe that's something that folks in Victorian studies would want to develop too. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to see that. So um, we have a lot of questions that have come in <laughs> during this, which I'm not, I'm not surprised. So uh, I'm going to ask Renee to come back and, and start um, fielding those questions or delivering those questions. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. And thank you guys. That was just a wonderful conversation. And just um, speaking to the last point that you were making, there were several people in the Q&A who had asked about whether there would be a possibility for sharing resources, assignments, um, you know, ways that you've gone about some of the teaching practices that you've discussed. So um, there are the resources um, that you've just described, but maybe after this, um, we can collect, you know, if you would be willing to share some of the things that you've done if we could collect some of the assignments and stuff and maybe make them available on the Dickens Project website just so people can you know see examples of the things you've done I think that would be really um, really helpful um, so as Ryan said there are a lot of questions so I'm gonna um, rather than kind of trying to read out specific questions I'm gonna just combine some of the sets of questions into single questions so um, one of the things that a lot of people asked about is the question of identification um, um, you know, the question of whether, you know, what to do with students who, who, you know, feel inclined to identify with characters, whether or not there are ways to help students think beyond identification in the ways they read, um, you know, whether there are ways to talk with students about, you know, about the kinds of characters they identify with and, you know, the kinds of characters they don't identify with, like how to just, how to approach the question of identification um, in a classroom and to think about the politics of, you know, of students identifying or choosing not to identify or choosing to read outside of um, the rubric of identification. So if, if maybe you guys can, can address that question, if there are strategies that you, you use to deal with that question, especially given one of the, one of the, um, questions mentioned the fact that that this person was drawn to Victorian literature um, you know as a, a white scholar particularly because Victorian literature seemed so incredibly foreign to her because um, you know it, it it wasn't the literature of now um, so so maybe just um, talk a little bit about about how to how to work with with those questions Um, so I think someone mentioned this yesterday too, but um, Jose Munoz is a wonderful resource for thinking about identification and disidentification. Um, that's been a strategy that's really, I mean, a, a, a literature that's been really useful for me, uh, Munoz's work on that subject. Um, but I think I'm also thinking, um, this isn't like a developed answer, but I've just been reading a lot of Jasper Puar in the last few days. So I also think maybe shifting away from a notion of identification that's based on a kind of singular, like one-to-one, -one, I identify with you, and moving towards a notion of assemblage, like how many bodies are brought together in this space? Like how many bodies does it require to make the body of one Tess or of one Dorothea Brooks, right? Like those kinds of questions are really productive for me as well. So moving towards a kind of multiplicity I mean, I, I'll add on to that and I, I'll say I do a lot of reflective writing in my courses um, and I think that's a place where students could work through their identifications or not with certain characters. Um, a lot of students in their reflective writing do talk about like, oh, I don't know what to say about this because it feels so distant from me. Um, and that is, then becomes a point of discussion. Why does it feel different from you? 
um, what do we do with that difference? Like, why, do, why don't you feel like you're the audience for this? Um, and in what ways does a text make you think that? Right? Can we look at specific passages where you see that happening? Um, I think I, I just love doing a lot of that kind of writing. It just opens up a lot of avenues, I think, for students who um, might just stop with the, oh, I like this character and that's it, or students who you know, have no idea what to say. Um, yeah. Sometimes I also do a lot of reflective writing. I think it's great um, for this exact reason. Sometimes I push a bit further, like why do you need to identify with someone in this text? Like what is that impulse? And I think, um, and, and it, it's interesting when it's like, a, a, a lot of my students are used to being able to find someone to identify with and when they can't, um, I find that an interesting moment of like, why would you assume that you had to identify with someone here to find pleasure and so it becomes like kind of just like to poke and i think sometimes that um is a useful um way of them finding other ways into the text in ways that alicia was gesturing towards so um i, I think the problem of not being able to, to identify can be a good point um of finding other ways of reading the text Yeah, and this is so minor um, compared to what everybody has said already, but sometimes when, um, you know, uh, we'll talk in a classroom about like contemporary adaptations or afterlives of certain Victorian texts and one comes to these sort of questions of, of who one casts to represent certain characters um, and the way, you know, film adaptations of Jane Eyre struggle to represent Bertha. And, um, you know, I think, of course, that involves questions of, it, it involves thinking about race, about racialization, about sort of thinking race more capaciously through assemblage and, and sort of other kinds of things, but also just sort of, um, you know, defamiliarizing the assumptions student might bring to a text and why they identify with certain characters and looking through sort of other uh, lives of those texts and then talking about sort of how they enable or disenable certain kinds of identifications. So. Thank you guys. Um, another big cluster of questions, um, and you've addressed some of these to some extent, but I'm going to put them on the table again, has to do with the question of curriculum. And so these are questions from Julia Rodas, Catherine Harris, Dustin Friedman, Molly Barnes, Barbara Rainey, Lauren Eriks Klein, and probably a few other people who I missed as I was copying them down. Um, and these are these are questions about um, about how to balance canonical texts and texts, um, you know, sort of new texts or contemporary texts or texts by people of color that aren't usually, um, you know, in in the Norton, which somebody also asked about, you know, the 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 Norton um, the Norton problem, and the recent readers' report about that. Um, and one of the one of the ways this was phrased by Dustin Friedman, um, he said, "I'm curious about your thoughts regarding how we can move away from teaching Victorian literature by simply adding new voices to the canon, um, and move towards really rethinking our fundamental approach to teaching." the field in a way that decenters whiteness. And you know, you guys have, have also been talking about this, but um, you know, but but how to how to deal with this problem that is on the one hand curricular and on the other hand pedagogical and political um, and you know and and about activism. I, I have a lot of thoughts about it. <laughs> if I can if I can jump in as a moderator. Um, I mean I think um, uh, and, and this is very much at the center of, of my own work. So this is something that I'm thinking a lot about. But um, I think, you know, the solution is not just to simply diversify the, the, the canon and, and to add um, more voices of color. I, I, even as I am in full agreement that we need to do that work, um, for me, the real question isn't like, is, is about how we do that and, and what, what those texts, what purpose are those texts serving in the class? Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that, I, and this was coming up when you were talking about Lilith Brood and, and Middlemarch, Alicia, is that it's like, what would happen if, if you read Lilith Brood first and then Middlemarch, right? Um, I think that there's a way in which our tendency is to kind of 
have the canon and then look at the counterpoint to the canon, right? And construct it in that, that mode. But what happens when we flip that around? Um, what happens when we don't just view um, text by writers of color as derivative or as affirming particular things in these canonical texts? What happens when we refract those, if, if we center the, the, if we center Mary Seacole, for instance, what happens to everything else that we do in, in the class, right? Um, and we start there and then, and then things change. Um, rather than say, oh, you know, here's Bertha, let's go find the erased Bertha in these other places. Um, I think that's the, it's, it's shifting those particular orientations um, and thinking about what's the epistemological frame that we're using to put these texts together. Um, and if it's about just still keeping certain kinds of aesthetic forms, cultural standards, cultural processes, historical processes, or even events at the center and not thinking about breaking that frame in any way, then it's gonna inevitably center whiteness. Um, but if we start to center other things, that frame starts to, to, to break apart or need to be reshifted um, in important ways. Um, I'll say because my department is going through curricular revision that one of the conversations we've been having a lot of is, well, I guess one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is that it's not about which period or which texts are important because we're all going to say they're all important depending on maybe, what we're specializing in. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with Ryan, you know, it's more about the kind of approaches or like the reasons why we have to require certain things or not, like what can be left to student choice and just see, um, you know, what they're interested in and, and the ways in which you uh, describe your, basically market your courses to them. Um, I mean, one of the things that we're thinking about in my department is like, again how how much british literature should be required um and i will admit like when you know uh the kind of core course that i teach about for british lit um we're discussing taking that out of the requirements and yeah again i will admit like when that first started happening i was like oh but what about me and like what i like to teach and um, it really i very quickly realized of course it's not about me i will still be able to teach the courses i want to teach It'll just be electives instead of requirements, and that's fine. Um, and in some ways, there might be more freedom in making them electives than core requirements. Um, and just again, my, my institution, we're really thinking a lot about what it means to be a Hispanic serving institution. It's not just about, hopefully, it's not just about the demographics, um, and hopefully, it's not just about the specific authors we teach. Um, yeah, hopefully it, there's some, some difference in pedagogy there as well. Um, so we are approaching the end of our time, but, um, but there are still a lot of people participating and there are a lot more questions. So, um, so if you don't mind hanging, hanging in here with us for, for maybe a few minutes extra, um, there's one more question that I would like to be able to get to before we close off today. And this is a question from, um, from Missy Gonzalez, who is a new graduate student, and I think this is an important question and, and probably a question that a lot of um, uh, undergraduates have and graduate students and also instructors, um, you know, at, at all different, um, you know, who, well, instructors who teach students of all different um, ages. Um, so this is what she asked. She says, as an undergrad, I wrote a paper about Edwin Drood, wherein I described Dickens's language about Neville uh, Landless as racist. And my TA told me I shouldn't say his language was racist because it wouldn't be considered racist at the time. While I do understand where she's coming from, I'm not sure I agree. So I'm wondering what other people tell their students about how to talk about that obviously coded racist language in a contemporary context that still acknowledges is the context of Dickens's own moment. So, you know, so how to how to deal with racist Victorian texts in a classroom. Maybe a lot of us are thinking about um, Carolyn Batinsky's um, ca like casual racism article, but I tell them that it is, it is racist and people knew it was racist. Like, you know, Collins and Dickens are at the same time and they have very different um, responses to the um, 
the India mutiny, right? So, I mean, it's not as if there's a monolithic set of responses. There was a question in the Q&A about Kipling. And um, when I still do teach white man's burden in the lower level classes sometimes, even though I always wonder if I should. When I do, the way that I teach it is, and in that exact same year when it was published, there are like several responses to Kipling, um, the black, the brown man's burden, the white woman's burden, like this, this sort of complex responses are happening at that moment in time as much as they're happening in our moment in time. So it's not as if we can always claim that we are better and like enlightened, of course we aren't, um, but also there's a set of very complex reactions at that time. And I think if you historicize, that's a really good way of of um, responding to that kind of thing. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting that students often associate the white man's burden with, with some idea of the British Empire, which while true, the poem was composed in response to American intervention in the Philippines. So it's just like this very glaring, you know, example of how whiteness gets consolidated across national boundaries into what we can recognize today as some idea of white supremacy and sort of continuing to foreground the ways in which contemporary standards for what is racist and is not, you know, are, are have a long history um, and they absolutely endure in, in the 19th century. And to just sort of unpack how that happens, right? To say something is absolutely racist like the white man's burden, I mean, it's vile and it's a terrible poem, but um, one can unpack it and sort of, as Alicia has you know, mentioned, sort of think critically and historicize um, how it has worked to generate um, ideas about, about whiteness. I will just um, signal and kind of lift up in, in conversations that uh, we've been having as organizers. Um, this, is, this is something that I've, I've taken to heart that, that um, Bridget Fielder, one of our co-organizers has, has uh, has brought brought to the table in our conversations is just you know it it's impossible to say that anti racism in way and and responses to anti blackness didn't exist in the 19th century if you don't read widely in uh, 19th century um, black and African American literature um, the only way one can make that that um, that claim is if you have read a very narrow set of texts um, and I think that in Victorian studies. Um, our, our field and our training has, has reified that small set of texts and given us a uh, false vision of what the, the, um, the 19th century world was like and what discourses were happening in it um, or, or the range of discourses that were happening in it. And so, you know, this is what part of what the pair is about is, is like that, that Harper <laughs> was writing in the late 19th century and responding and doing all these things and had a long career and, and um, right alongside Dickens. So, um, so we need to think about all of those voices in as part of the 19th century um, and that they were talking to one another and that they existed. And so um, I just kind of want to bring that, that into the, the, the conversation here as, as also a key part of the, the pair and, and what we're trying to do with this week's program and, and next year's program as well. So. Am I closing us out? Sure. <laughs> that that um, seems like a wonderful place. And I'm going to turn this back over, Ryan, to you just just in a minute to actually close it out. But um, but I just wanted to um, thank all of the panelists for those wonderful answers to questions, and also um, to say to all of you who are um, who are still here, we at the Dickens Project are really excited that this. Um, that this week's program can be free and the registration can be open to anybody who would like to join us. Um, but we do also rely on donations um, in order to keep our programming going to be able to offer scholarships to students. Um, and so if um, uh, somebody is going to put a, a link to the Dickens Project website um, in the chat. So if you have the means at all to be able to donate and help keep programs like this running, we would really, really, really appreciate that. Um, but I don't want to end on that note. So I'm going to turn it back over to Ryan. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, so I'll just echo my thanks to, to Rajani, Alicia, Alicia, and, and Sophia for uh, this conversation today. And, and um, I just um, am so grateful for your time and energy and the work that you're doing and, and just inspired by your leadership in, in our field. Um, I, it's really wonderful.
Um, and I just want to signal boost um, the programs that are happening um, uh, Wednesday and Thursday on Francis C.W. E. Harper. Um, I think that, you know, these questions around, you know, what do we teach? How do we teach? How do we make the materials that we teach more diverse? Um, Harper is, is a way to do that. And if we listen to these wonderful and amazing Harper experts and scholars from early, 19, uh, early African American literature, um, that we can learn so much from them about how to do this work um, because they, they have done it and are doing it. Um, and this, this goes to what Rajani, Alicia, and Amy were, were signaling towards in, in the, the LA Review of Books piece. I mean, we need to talk to other fields. And so please, please attend those panels um, because I think it'll be a real model and a, a point of entry for, um, for how we can start doing this work in Victorian studies. Uh, thank you everyone for, so much for sticking around. Take care.